Welcome. Thank you very much. Channel 3, glad to, uh, glad to have you here. I'm glad to be uh, here. You're actually uh, skipping lunch, I think, to be here uh, with us. I know, I know. You owe me a lunch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, for people who missed your talk this morning, you yeah. are introduced as a data scientist, a mathematician and psychologist, and you spent your life catching serial killers, yeah. catching... Well, y y you have a very broad background. I invite everybody to read the full bio. <laughs> we won't do that fully. But this morning, as an opening keynote, like in music, we're in New Orleans, so set, you set go. the tone for this Congress, right? For those people who miss it, what was your key message this morning on stage? I think the key message is uh, there's become this pervading fear of data science and mathematics and looking at behaviors and market research and discounting the value of qualitative research. And the message I wanted to bring is nothing could be further from the truth. I think numbers are wonderful, data is wonderful, but qualitative research is what put flesh is what puts flesh on the bones. It's what gives substance and meaning and something remarkable to research. And so I think the two working in synthesis, uh, that's really where we need to be going as, as an industry. Yeah, because I, th I think I saw you give an example that the key was the context, right? It's not that's so right. much about the answer, but it's about the context of the answer. That's exactly right. Uh, depending on what the question is, depending on the context of the response, and depending on how the response is offered, you know, um, <laughs> Thank Apparently you. Better? Better? Yeah. There yeah. we go. Uh, keep it uh, closed like an ice cream Thank cone. you very much. lunch. <laughs> 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 Finally, I got something to eat. It'll be a microphone. Yeah, I, I think understanding people's behavior in one context versus another gives you very different insights into them. And historically, when we've done survey market research uh, or any other market research, we've looked at the answers in isolation as if that tells us something. And we have to embed that within something more meaningful. And before we dive a little deeper in that, what I heard, because I was watching with one eye your, uh, your keynote, and you said, well, I have this story that if you give me six murderers, I can tell you where the serial killer lives, but I'll tell you if I have some more time. Well, here is some well, more time, so tell us that's how you do that. true. There yeah. is a mathematical concept called Cajonan-type neural networks, okay. and you can use this. Uh, uh, I won't get into the technical math of it, but there's an extension of neural networks. Think of it as a big grid, a big map, right? And we put probabilities in each one of the little cells across that map. If we find six or more kills, murders, that meet up with uh, specific criterion, we know that information about them, we can hone in on where the killer lives. And the way to do it is actually really interesting. Uh, all you have to know to catch serial killers is cops love donuts yeah. and serial killers hate donuts. And so here's what you do. Do you add the donut shop as a probability? What you do if you're looking for the cops, but not if you're <laughs> looking for the serial killers. If you're looking for serial killers, you realize they don't kill within a certain radius of their house. Right? Very few killers yeah. kill across the street from where they live. BTK was an, an exception, but for the most part, they have a safe zone, a safe radius around their home so that they can come back. They also won't go too far away, right? Yeah. Because you want to be able to get back home. Exactly. And so you can think of it as this donut. This ring. For, uh, ah, there's the donut. There yeah. you go. And yeah. now it's not just on flat two dimensions. It's, uh, we're mathematicians, so we work in infinite dimensions. And so it's infinite dimensional space. It uses some uh, concepts from algebraic topology, uh, a bunch of fancy math. But yeah, you can hone in on that. And we've done the same thing to find moms who like to That's take pictures of their going. children. That's where I was going. Because serial killers, our viewers might be thinking, well, I'm not catching for serial killers. I don't work for the cops. But then the little comment was, I can just as easy find moms who yeah. buy Whatever. And so how does it work there? So, so you create a, a grid and you, you assess certain probabilities to certain events? Or? And that's exactly it. The same technology you use to find serial killers, you can use to find people who really like serial. Because what you're doing is you're looking within regions and you're seeing what the probabilities are for the various people and you make those sort of assertions. Now in those, you would put a donut shop or you'd put a competitor. And so we worked with a major retail chain. We won't name which one. Okay. They wanted to find moms who like to take pictures of their kids. And so we put their stores in there, but we put the competitor stores in there. And we saw how far they live and where they live. And that drove what circulars they were able to distribute and how they were able to attract people differentially into the store more effectively. Within that, we did some segmentation to understand which circulars would resonate and which offers would resonate more with which kinds of folks. 
Wow, so very, very fascinating. So I guess this is a pitch that we might get a little bit more mathematical about interpreting our data, right? You know, I think that's exactly it. I, we have sort of limited ourselves in market research to doing basic descriptive statistics to just counting things, right? How many people responded a four or five on a five-point Likert scale, or on average, how many people liked this or didn't like that? What we really need to do is bring more sophisticated mathematics to be able to gain real insight into these, this information into the data we have. We now have the data to do it. What we don't have so much are the techniques, or at least we don't have access to them, but those techniques exist, and that's really what my group and I do, is we bring those capabilities to our partners who are doing the market research. And that leads that to an ability to read minds. At yeah. scale, yeah, and yeah. that's where it really becomes interesting. How, where, what, can, can you summarize briefly, how do you read minds? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I can, you can read mine right now. You know that I'm hungry because I haven't eaten yet, right? True, but, but that's an easy one. Uh, that is an easy one, but most of them are easy. We find out that if we look at the constellation of behaviors people engage in, if we want to find people who like uh, certain products, certain services, I'll have you read mine's right now. Uh, you're going to think you're biasing, you're stereotyping, but I'm going to tell you about one of my customers who we find out he likes pickup trucks, hunting dogs, he collects Confederate flags, and he belongs to the NRA. Do you know something about him? He's probably living in Texas. Well, <laughs> probably. <laughs> we know a lot about yeah. him, don't we? Yeah. And we know yeah. it from, I gave you, let's see, four Attributes. things about him. Yeah. Just four pieces of data, really, right? So as you but have how, some how is that not stereotyping, though? It is stereotyping. But, but stereotyping are you saying we should use been, that more? I think we should. I think we should be using stereotyping and profiling, but done right, right? How do Typically, you do that, right? when we stereotype people, when we talk about it in, in sort of in the wild, we base it on superficial qualities that are meaningless to us. We base it most commonly on things like race or gender or my most hated term right now, millennials. Mm -hmm. We act as if everyone 15 to 35 is somehow alike. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. What we need to do is create not stereotypes but topologies. We need to create a type that somebody is similar to, right? And so people who like hunting dogs and, and pick up trucks and Confederate flags and belong to the NRA, there's nothing wrong with that. No. And there's nothing wrong with saying that people who manifest those four qualities might also more or less like this thing. And that's only four things. Once we know 4,000, 400,000, 4 million, and that's really what my group does, is we do that at scale, and we get all these insights from all these different perspectives to be able to infer the next thing about them. It's very similar to um, what Netflix does when you're watching a movie. In effect, and it they are stereotyping. It, exactly. People who like this movie and this movie and this movie will also like that one. Well, to conclude that into a, a lesson for market researcher, Basically, I guess what you're saying is that this industry should move less from data collection, so to speak, and much more into harvesting more from existing data. Is that basically the message? I think so, but you know, uh, you mentioned I'm a data scientist, mathematician, yeah, psychologist. Yeah, this is your game. Well, and let me say, uh, we, we talk about those things as if they're wow and out there somewhere. Data science really if you boil it down, is just about finding meaning in unimaginable amounts of information. That's all it is. Mathematics is really just the science of patterns. Mm -hmm. That's all you're doing. Yeah. Psychologists, we all do the same thing, whether it's an experimentalist working with rats in a maze or a clinician working with clients on a couch. We describe, understand, predict, and influence behaviors. And so what we do and what we're suggesting more people start to do is look through amazing amounts of information to find patterns that describe, understand, predict, and influence behaviors. Wow. That's it. Nice. Well, to round off, I think you had a very cool presentation. You also had quite some fresh slides. Very visible. <laughs> you started with welcome Ezomarians, right? right? How much time did you spend on designing the deck? <laughs> Uh, way more time than I'd care to admit. <laughs> All right, but that's probably because you find that very important, right? I do. I, I, I'll tell you, I'm thrilled uh, to be here. I've been so impressed by everyone I've met, by the work that's being done, by the, the cutting edge thinking that's being employed. Uh, it was worth every second that I spent preparing for this. Uh, I couldn't be happier. Cool. Cool, because I wanted to segue a little bit towards the next topic that we're going to talk about, and that is actually about this power of storytelling and how it's not so much about the information, but also by the way you present it, which you did very well. well Thank you very much, and let's have a look at this clip that's all about storytelling.
Around the world every day, thousands if not millions of people give presentations. Some are great and have a powerful impact on their audiences. Others, well, let's just say they're works in progress. This is Powerful Presentations, simply stated. Meet Jim, an aspiring professional trying to make it in the world. Jim used to give presentations like just about everyone else he knew. PowerPoint was his tool of choice. He'd use it like an outline, with a header followed by bullet after bullet, and sometimes even sub-bullets. When he wanted to be fancy, he'd add what usually turned out to be an ineffective chart, or sometimes a table. And when Jim wanted to really spice things up, he'd add, yep, clip art. Unfortunately, Jim's approach would often confuse and bore people. This was a problem because he had important things to say, and because it was dimming his prospects for success. Fortunately, Jim learned a better way and didn't stay in the dark for long. Perhaps most importantly, he now focuses on the story he wants to tell. In doing so, he tries to follow a simple structure with a clear beginning, middle, and end that links together his various points and builds to his conclusion. When formulating his story, Jim uses a simple pad of paper or sticky notes. Staying low-tech at this stage helps him think more creatively and stay outside the box. He then considers what will best help him tell his story. Jim sometimes opts to use a whiteboard, flip charts, handouts, or even no props at all. When it makes sense for him to use PowerPoint, he tries to remember the adage that sometimes less is more. He doesn't dumb down his presentations, but he does try to limit each slide to one key idea. Or, depending on the content, he sometimes builds an idea incrementally so it's easy to follow. He always looks for visual ways to tell his story, with supporting images, minimal text, and clear charts and graphs. Sometimes he uses quotes, but he tries to remember that people can't read his slides and truly listen at the same time. Jim still uses plenty of text to help him remember what he wants to say, but he hides it in his notes that only he sees. Jim's new approach takes more time, energy, and rehearsal. It's been well worth the effort. His audiences are now much more engaged and better understand and remember his presentations. And, as if that weren't enough, his pocketbook doesn't mind either. This has been Powerful Presentations, Simply Stated.